this. I understand tonight that uh, this is the last night of freedom for a few of, among us. These sitting down in front of me will return to school in the morning. And all of them said, no. wow. <laughs> and all the parents said, yeah. wow. <laughs> we'll just leave that right there. First Kings chapter 17, verse 8 through 10. Keep your finger there because we will come back and read quite a bit here tonight. I am conscious of the time. I know that kids need to be home early and into bed, so we will move quickly tonight. But I believe that God will do something amazing among us in this house. I, how many of you know that he still does miracles? I said, how many of you know that he's still in the miracle working business? I want to talk to you tonight about the path to a miracle. And the path to a miracle at times goes through uncomfortable territory. 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 8 through 10. The Bible said, Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called her and said to her, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. Lord, we thank you, Father, tonight for the Holy Ghost. And we thank you for the presence of God that we felt in this place this morning. Lord, we expect no less tonight. I pray tonight that you will crown this altar with the very power and the presence of an almighty God. Lord, let the words that would come from my mouth tonight not be my own, but be the words that you would have me to speak. And we'll be sure to give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody that's in agreement said... God bless you as you are seated tonight. I want to do something that would be a little different for me than the way that I would normally go, but I want everybody in the house to bow your head. Nobody is looking around tonight. I want to know who I'm talking to tonight. If you're here, you are here, and you would say, Pastor Britt, I need a miracle tonight. Just slip your hand up. Nobody's looking around. I need a miracle tonight tonight. There are hands all over the house. Let me tell you now as you look up that you are in the right place. I said you are in the right place. Come on somebody, you're in the place of all places. I'd rather be here than any other place tonight. And so I want you to listen tonight to what the Lord would have to say to you. When you are scared to death, and vulnerable, you don't know where to go, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know which way to go, you don't know how long it's going to take, and you don't know what's going to happen when you get there, you just simply don't know what else to do. Has anybody else been in that place before? I'll raise my hand tonight, I've been in that place where I just simply did not know what else to do. And so tonight you are in the right place and you will remember tonight that the path to a miracle is always through uncomfortable territory. I wish tonight that we could just say a prayer and it would fall in our lap. I wish tonight we did not have to face difficulties, Brother Kim. I wish tonight we didn't have to face tragedies in our lives. I wish tonight we didn't have to face financial reversal. But let me say to you tonight, if it was not for difficulty along the way, how would you ever know what God has placed on the inside of you? Come on, if you, di if you didn't have difficulty along the way, how would you know the power of an almighty God? And for some of us, if we didn't have difficulty, God would never hear from us otherwise. Because when we are mountain living, everything's okay when we are mountain living, amen? There's no need to come to an altar. There's no need for anointing oil when you're living on the mountain. But if, if it wasn't for difficulty, God would never hear from some of us. The path to a miracle at times goes through uncomfortable territory. In fact, I'll go ahead and speak for myself tonight. Most miracles that I have ever had has gone through some very uncomfortable times. 
It has gone through some very difficult times. It has gone through things that I have wished that I had never gotten involved in or to be in, but God always shows up. I said God always shows up. He's always on time. Let me tell you tonight, he's an 11.59 and 59 second God. He may not always show up exactly when you want him to, but he always shows up. He always shows up. In order tonight for us to understand that our path is difficult at times, in order for us to understand the meaning of the scripture that I've read to you, we've got to go back just a little bit tonight and get a bit of history to the story that I have introduced to you. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1 through 4, the Bible said, And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith which flows into the Jordan and it will be that you shall drink from that brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Now you have to get by this brook with me tonight. You've got to get in this story tonight. Elijah, the Lord has instructed him to go to Ahab to tell him it's going to stop raining. There'll be no rain. There's going to be a drought. Now, if you and I were Elijah, we probably would not have wanted to carry that word. Come on, somebody. We would not have wanted to go, but God said, if you'll do what I tell you, I will always take care of you. If you'll do what I say, I promise that you'll never be thirsty, and I promise that I'll feed you there. Listen to me. There is in a miracle an essence of obedience that you must follow at times. Now I know that I just said a bad word when I said obedience because we, at times, we want to, again, like I said this morning, we want to treat God like a Santa Claus at times. We want to put on our wish list and hope that it just falls. We don't want to have to pay our tithes to get an... We don't want to have to, we don't want to have to go to the altar. We don't want to have to, we want it to fall just in my lap. And so God said to Elijah, if this is what you will do, then I will make sure that you will be fed and you will be taken care of. Those who worshiped Baal believed he was the God who brought the rains and a bountiful harvest. So when Elijah walked into the presence of this Baal-worshiping king and told him there would be no rain for several years, Ahab was in fact shocked. Ahab had built a strong military defense, but it would be no help against the drought. I said it would be no help against the drought. Let me tell you tonight, the enemy may have told you that you're not gonna make it. The enemy may have told you that you'll never walk in victory. Come on, somebody. The enemy may have told you you'll never be healed, but listen, nothing that he can build against you tonight can stop the promises of God from coming to pass in your life. Somebody say amen. The enemy can come and he can huff and he can puff, but he'll never blow your house down. Come on, somebody. He can come and sit on your shoulder and tell you that it's over and he can tell you that you are no good. In fact, let's hang around there just for a moment. One of the greatest tactics the enemy has is to take your self-worth. If the enemy can ever take your self-worth, then he's got you. If the enemy can ever make you feel less than worthy, come on somebody, if the enemy can ever make you feel less than worthy to receive from God, then he's got you. Because we all want to be a part. Come on, we all want to be loved. Come on, I don't care how manly you are tonight and how prideful we may be. All of us want to be loved. Come on, anybody remember when you were in elementary school or in grade school or whatever you called it back then? You remember way back then, did anybody ever want to be picked last for the team? Oh no, we always wanted to be picked first. When we were dividing up teams and there were captains, come on, how many of you wanted to be the captain? Come on, I know know a lot of us want to be the captain. We want to be the captain of the church. We want to be captain of everything. Come on. We wanted to be captains. But if we weren't captains, we wanted to be picked first. 
And if we were picked last, listen, I weighed 75 pounds in the ninth grade, in the summer of my ninth grade year. I quickly got over it, as you can tell, but I was always picked last. Nobody ever wants to be picked last. If the enemy can take your self-worth, he's got you. If the enemy can ever take who you believe you are, if the enemy can ever take your identity, then he has got you exactly where he wants you. There's an old saying that goes like this, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Let me tell you, that's a lie tonight. I said that's a lie from hell tonight. Those words will stick with you forever. Come on, I'm, I'm, we're headed somewhere tonight. I'm just trying to help you tonight. The, the enemy, if those, word, those words will stick with you forever. I remember in North Little Rock, Arkansas, the second grade, I attended Victory Baptist private school in the second grade. And every morning, as my mother would take us to school, I walked down the hallway. My classroom was the last classroom on the left in Mrs. Jones' classroom. And I would walk to that classroom. Mrs. Jones wore a dress every day to church or to school. And she wore horn, those horn rim glasses. Anybody remember those? Oh, now you're dating yourself a little. She wore those chrome horn rim glasses as well. And she would stand at that classroom door. And when I would walk in, she would always look over the top of those glasses at me. I sat in the front row in between a little girl called Robin and a little boy called Michael. And I remember to this day when Mrs. Jones walked to my desk in the second grade and she looked over those glasses at me and she said, Britt Brooks, she said, you ask way too many questions. She said, you are a dumb little boy and you will never amount to anything. Well, Mrs. Jones, where are you today? I said, Mrs. Jones, where are you today? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That is a lie. Words stick with you forever. Come on, sticks. You ever got a whipping? You needed one, I'll bet. Listen, you need to sit down there where Torrin is and let you answer everything and stay in trouble all the time. When I was in elementary school, I got enough whippings for everybody in this section. And let me tell you, it was in those days when they whipped you. And when, my, when the principal, when C.C. Hunt got done whipping me, my mother was standing there in the office and she would take the paddle and she would whip me as well, standing in that office. I think we ought to go back to some of those days along the way. I said, I think we ought to go back to, listen, we giving them today, we're giving them every pill known to man when a little whipping along the way will take care of a whole lot of things. We better move on past that. C.C. Hunt would whip me. I could hear that paddle coming before it ever connected. You understand? He had a fiberglass paddle with holes drilled in it. I'm telling you, he put stripes on the sun and he could whip you, he could wear you out. But let me tell you today, I'm not still hurting from that. I am over that. But there are words along the way in your life that will steal your self-confidence. But let me tell you tonight, God said he loves you. He cares for you. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. No matter what everybody else says about you, he said, you are my chosen Ahab had built a military defense, but they couldn't stop the rain. That military could not stop the rain. And Elijah bravely controlled the man who led his people into evil. And he told of the power greater than that pagan God. Elijah told of the power of an almighty God. And listen to me, I'm here as one sent from God tonight to tell you that there's a God that you serve tonight that is bigger than your sickness. There's a God that you serve tonight that is bigger than what you walked in here with. Somebody say amen. Listen, tonight, when rebellion and heresy were at an all-time high in Israel, God responded not only with words, but he also responded with action. 
You go back and study this. Rebellion was at an all-time high at Israel during this time that I have just read to you. Does that not sound, does that not sound like the world that you and I are living in today? Rebellion is at an all high in our world today. The spirit of Antichrist is everywhere. You look, but let me tell you, honey, we're not going down. I said it's not over. I said it's not over. This old ship of Zion called the church. It isn't over yet. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, it isn't over. It isn't over. It isn't over. God not only responded with words, but he also responded with action. In a nation that was required by law to care for its prophets, go back and study. In the nation that was required by law to care for its prophets, isn't it ironic that God turned to ravens and a widow to take care of Elijah? Isn't it ironic tonight that God turned to unclean birds and a foreigner in Jezebel's home territory? You didn't get that. Listen, isn't it ironic tonight that in Jezebel's territory, in the enemy's camp, God supplied. Listen, tonight God can take from the enemy's camp to give to you exactly what you have need of tonight to take care of you. God has help where we least expect it. I said, God has help where we least expect it. A few years ago, or quite a few years ago now, Joni and I, I told you a few services ago, we were, we were broke, we were poor. When we got started, we didn't have anything. And a church in South Arkansas called me to come preach a revival. And I'm telling you, Joni and I, we just lived day by day. Anybody ever been? <laughs> Some folks live Friday to Friday. We were living Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday. In fact, sometimes we were living from Monday morning to Monday at noon. And Monday at noon till dark on Monday. It's just the way we live. We live by faith. Come on, today we live by credit. We live by so many other things. Joni and I, we were struggling, living by faith, living strictly by faith. A little church in South Arkansas come, called me to come preach a revival. And, and, and honest to God, we, I didn't have the money even to get there, Brother Gary. I didn't, ha I didn't even have the money. We had $20 to our account. That's all we had. That's all we had to our name was $20. I was called to that revival to preach for a week. The truck I was driving at that time was an old used Dodge. Please don't make fun of a Dodge. It was all I had at that time. Still have one now. <laughs> $20 is all we had. Pastor, would you come preach us a revival? I walked out, looked at the gas tank in my truck. I had three quarters of a tank of gas. I told Joni, I said, you keep the $20 because you've got, you've got to go to work all week long. I said, God will take care of me. If I'm doing the right thing by going to preach this revival, God will take care of me. I got in my truck, I headed south to Camden, Arkansas. I got to that church, met the pastor. That first night I preached, I preached as hard as I possibly could preach. There were people filled in the altar. And let me tell you, before I left that service, I had enough money. People had walked by and said, Pastor, I just want to bless you. We just want to take care of you. We just want to bless you. When I walked out of that service that night, I had $300 cash in my pocket. Let me tell you, at that time, that could have been a million dollars. I said, at that time, it could have been a million dollars. When you're desperate and don't know what else to do, are you in that place tonight? Yeah. I finished preaching that revival. I preached all the way till Saturday. I drove home, got ready to go. The pastor said to me Saturday afternoon, he said, as you go home, he said, there's a little grocery store down at the end of the road. He said, if you'll pull in there, tell them you're from the church and, and fill your gas tank up to go home. We just want to be a blessing to you. I said, thank you. I drove home that night. Listen, I left and we only had $20. I left home, I had a pocket full of money and was happy because of what the Lord had done. I'm talking to you tonight about going through a miracle and the pathway at times is difficult. At times you don't understand what God is trying to get you to see. Drove all the way home. I got home that night. Joni is already asleep. Already in bed. So she didn't know what had happened. 
We got up the next morning to go to church. I had to be there early. I was on staff there and I had to be there early. So I got up and got dressed before she got there. That morning in the service, we had a service about like what we had this morning. People were being blessed. God was doing amazing things. I was standing at the altar on this side of First Assembly, Malvern First Assembly. I was standing there praising the Lord and with my pocket full of money. How many of you know God knows when you start building a little rat hole? I'm standing there and I was praising God because we were rich. I was standing there praying and the Lord spoke to me and said, Give what you have in your pocket to so and so. I thought, The devil is a liar. We have $20. I don't even know if we have $20 or anymore or not. I've been gone all week. I stood there for a few more minutes. I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying to help somebody tonight. I'm standing there. The Lord spoke to me and said again and said, I said, give that money to so-and-so. I knew so-and-so. I knew she had a house full of kids. Her husband had left her. She didn't have a dime to her name. I stood there and I said, Lord, if this is you, then you tell Joni exactly what I have in my pocket because she doesn't know. If this is you, God, I want you to tell Joni because I'm struggling, God. I'm struggling. We needed a miracle and now I have the miracle in my pocket. I've got it now. And I, if this is you, I need you to tell Joni or I'm going to be in big trouble. I turned around and started back down the aisle towards her and all I could see was the top of her head. I walked over to her and she's crying uncontrollably and in her lap is our checkbook. I said, what's wrong with you? She said, the Lord spoke to me and said, give sister so-and-so this certain amount of money. And she said, we don't have that money. And I said, oh, yes, we do. It's right here in my pocket. She said, the Lord spoke to me and said, this is the amount. I said, that's the exact amount I have in my pocket. Listen, I had giver's remorse for a moment. Come on, anybody else? I'm standing there, Lord, I don't want to give it. We, we've got to pay our bills. We're going to be in trouble. Come on, I'm talking to you about a miracle. I'm talking to you about getting through this hard head at times that if God said it, he will take care of you every single time. She wrote the check out. I folded it up, walked over to so-and-so, handed her the check. She got blessed all over the place. I walked off. The next day, I was mowing my yard on my riding lawnmower. I'm mowing the yard and I looked across the street at a little old lady's house that lived across the street from me and her yard was about that tall in grass. I thought I'll run over there and I'll mow her yard on this riding lawnmower. It won't take just a second to mow her yard. It took me about seven minutes to mow her yard and I'm driving down the sidewalk back to my house and somebody's tapping me on the shoulder. I turned around and it's that little old lady and she's got an envelope. She said, the Lord told me to give you this envelope. I said, I'm not taking any money. It didn't take me just a second to mow the yard. She's a little Baptist lady. She said, are you gonna argue with what God said? I said, I'm not taking that money. She said, but the Lord said, take it. I took it from her, put it in my pocket and went on and mowed the rest of my yard. When I got off of that lawnmower, I'm talking to you about a difficult path. I got off that lawnmower and opened that envelope and it was for every single red cent that I had given that morning to that lady let me tell you if you'll just be obedient there's a miracle waiting for you there's a miracle but it takes obedience even when I don't want to do it oh Lord I'm, you're speaking to me to give her a hundred dollars tell somebody else to do it Tell somebody else to do it. Listen, God has help where we least expect it. 
where we least expect it. He provides for us in ways that go beyond our narrow definitions or our narrow expectations. And no matter how bitter our trials, no matter how seemingly hopeless our situation may be, no matter how difficult it may be, we should look to God every single time because he has a way. He'll make your high place low and he'll make the crooked place straight. He'll make a way where there seemeth to be no way. Am I talking to anybody in this house tonight? We ought to get excited about that. I'm not serving an image. I'm not serving a book full of fables. I'm serving a book full of truth. I said I'm serving a book full of truth and a God that owns a cattle on a thousand hills and he doesn't mind to sell one of those cattle to get you out of trouble. Listen, do we believe it or do we not? Do we believe it or do we not? I believe that it's time now that we're coming to a point in this world where there's been a line drawn in the sand for the believer to say, do you really believe in me? Do you really believe that healing was for you? Do you really believe that it was blessing for you or not? Oh, I know, we get, we get upset with other people in the church because they get blessed and we don't. Oh, I got a, something up a tree right there. Oh, we get mad when somebody else gets something and we don't. Well, I've been uh, here for 25 years. I've been this and I've been that. A home I had when I lived in Houston. Joni and I have, have, had, a, have had a habit of flipping houses in order to make some extra money along the way. And so I've enjoyed doing that. And so we have stuffed some of that back along the way. And we were living in a very nice home in Houston. And the rumor got started that I had paid half a million dollars for that home. I wish to God I had half a million dollars. When somebody gets blessed, we, I would, as the Lord is my witness, I would stand on my front porch and catch them every now and then. They're driving by with the cell phone taking a picture of my house so they could show somebody else. Listen, I'm not upset over your blessing because I know God's no respecter of persons that if he'll heal you, he'll heal me. If he'll bless you, he'll bless somebody else. We find his providence in strange places. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 13 through 16. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear and go as you have said, but make me a cake first and bring it to me. And afterward make for yourself, make some for yourself and for your son. Now listen, if I'm the little old lady and I'm needing a miracle, I don't care that you're hungry. 1 Verse 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall be, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he uh, ate of her household for many days, and the bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord which was spoken by the prophet Elijah. When the widow, listen to me, when the widow met Elijah, she thought she was preparing for her last meal, but a simple act of faith produced a miracle in her life that was forever lasting, that not only affected her, but affected her son, it affected her family, and listen to me, tonight by your simple act of obedience no matter what it may be it will affect everybody around you she trusted Elijah and she gave him all she had to eat she gave him all she had to eat listen tonight faith is a step between promise and assurance I said faith is a step between promise and assurance. Miracles seem so far out of reach for us. Miracles seem so far out of reach for us. Come on, I'm talking to us tonight. I'm, I'm talking to you. Miracles, I'm talking about the dead raised and, and, and fingers growing back. I, I'm talking about bona fide miracles. I'm not talking about you getting a happy meal tonight. I'm talking about bona fide miracles. Where are they in the church today? 
Why are we not seeing bona fide miracles? It's happening around the world. A few years ago, I went to Argentina. I've read all of Carlos Anacondia's books, Claudio Freitzon. If you've not read them, you do yourself well to go and get them and read them. Claudio Freitzon is one of the leading pastors in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He has 30,000 people in his church. They are seeing the dead raised. They are seeing limbs grow back. They are seeing amazing things happen. I've read all of those books and I thought I want to go see that happen. So I put myself and a friend of mine on an airplane and we went. They have 30,000 people in their church. The church holds 3,000 at a time. They have 11 services from Friday morning to Sunday night to run all of those people through their church. Every week. 30,000 people. I stayed in a hotel just down the road and let me tell you, let me tell you, they line up early to go to church. Come on. I said they line up early. They get there early. They show up for the prayer meeting. They're lined up around the building and we have to beg. I said we have to beg people to come to church. We have to beg people to show up to church and they're there lined up because we knew some of the people and we were guests there. They took us in ahead of some of the other people and set us down on the front row. And we're sitting there in one of those services and as the Lord, as my witness that morning when they turned the worship team loose, I thought, I thought heaven would come at any second. They sang and they sang and they sang and they sang and they sang, they sang, they sang, they sang, they sang, they sang, they sang for two hours. stay over here they sang for two hours after 30 minutes most of us would have checked out after 15 minutes most of us would have checked it to them and we'd have went on down the street to the next church What's wrong with Pastor Gary today? Does he not know that I have something in the crock pot? Does he not know that Dallas is playing today? Does he not know that there's a sale and I gotta get home? Hurry up and get this over with. You have one hour to get me up off of my pew. If you can't get me excited in an hour, I'm leaving and I'll probably go to another church. 30,000 people, 11 services. Standing there in the service, go check it out. The government came in and closed the church down a month before I got there because there would be so many people praising at one time in that church, jumping up and down and worshiping God that they cracked the foundation of the apartments across the street and closed those apartments and we can't even get people to clap their hands in a service. We can sing. We've got some of the best singers in the world, but we can't get them to join the choir. We've got some of the best talent in the world, but those people sang and they worshiped and the government closed the church and made them come in and tear out the entire sanctuary and put a floor in that would handle that many people praising God at one time. I'm standing there in that service. I'm telling you, it's coming unwound. Singing for two hours. I'll have to be honest with you. I myself thought what you would think. What are we doing? There's a gentleman standing behind, beside me. I can speak Spanish. I turned around to him. I said, what, sir, what are we doing? He looks at me and in English he said, oh, you must be from America. <laughs> Hold on, why are you laughing? You would have done the same thing. He looked at me and he said, you must be from the United States. I said, well, I am. He said, well, 
He said, Pastor, he said, here we sing until something happens. He said, we worship until he comes. He said, we worship until we stir the Spirit of God and something happens. He said, do you want to know what your problem is? I thought, no, but I figure you're going to tell me. He said, your problem is in America, you have an answer for everything. He said, you have a pill bottle for a headache. You don't go to God, you go to Tylenol. He said, when you got a banking problem, you go to the banker. He said, when you got lawyer problem, you go to a lawyer. He said, in America, you have an answer for everything. He said, but when these people have a problem, he said, if that pastor tells them that God's a healer, that's all they have to hold on. That's why we're seeing miracles take place. I pray God send it back to the America, send it back to Van Buren First Assembly. Help us, God, to throw our watches away and go back to a powerful move of the Almighty God in our lives. That's what he intended to. But now we have to hire cheerleaders to get us up off of a pew. And we want the preacher to preach three points in a poem and let me go home. And then we wonder why there's no power in our prayer. Then we wonder why the sick aren't being healed. Then we wonder why the dead aren't being raised. I'm telling you in just a few minutes, after I sat down and repented, I sat down in my my pew, the chair there in that sanctuary, and I said, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for my attitude. Forgive me, God, for my attitude. And let me tell you, in just a few moments, what they were waiting on finally came. I'm telling you, it was like it rained in that sanctuary. It was like it was just a cold rain in that sanctuary. I can't explain it. Listen to me. I'm not not being critical tonight, but I'm not falling out for just anybody. I'm not falling out because your hair's parted on one side or how many books you wrote. If I'm going out on the floor, I'm not doing a courtesy drop for you. It's going to be something real. And that pastor walked to that pulpit and he raised his hand and as God is my witness, 3,000 people, including myself, were on the floor and you could not get up off that floor. Let me tell you, I wish God would send a hunger to this church. I wish God would send a hunger to the community that we didn't care about what time it was. We didn't care about who got blessed. I just want to be, I just want to be in the presence of an almighty God. I want to see people get up out of a wheelchair and do things they've never done. I want to see cancer heal. What's going to bring the lost to the church in these last days? It's not going to be our programs. We program them to death. It's not going to be our music, however, it is absolutely wonderful. What's going to bring them to an old-fashioned altar and what's going to be revival in the church again is the power of an almighty God moving again among us. And it takes people like you and it takes people like me to be a God chaser. Miracles seem so far out of reach. In fact, we've just dismissed them at times. I'll tell you, I believe if you'll create an atmosphere, God will do it again. We may not see the solution until we take a step of faith first. I said you may never see a solution until you take a step of faith first. In order for them to cross the Jordan to get onto the promised land, somebody had to step in the Jordan first. Come on. I understand the story about Peter. And everybody may have think that he's crazy, but at least he had the gall to get out of the boat. The rest of the guys just sat there and didn't do a thing. I'm looking for some people. I'm looking for a church that will say, God, if that's you, call us. If that's you, God, call us out on the water, no matter what it looks like, no matter the storm or how deep the water is. If it's you, I'll step out of that boat. I'll take the first step in order for miracles to come and for you to bring what you want to bring to this city and to this church. It takes a step of faith. Well, pastor, you don't know my circum- the circumstances I'm under. Well, who allowed you and who told you it was okay to get under them first of all? First Kings chapter 17, I'm almost finished. 
Would you come back to the piano and encourage them that I'm done? 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 17. Listen to me. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. If you're reading this story, if I'm reading this story, I would have thought it enough for you to ask me for all of my food. I would have thought it to be enough for you to ask me for the oil. I would have thought that that was enough. Listen, God wants everything you have. I said he wants everything you have. Oh yeah, we, we'll give him bits and pieces. Oh yeah, Lord, I'll give you, I'll give you this hour. I'll give you this hour. I, I'll give you 15 minutes of Bible reading today. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm going to give you the prayer time. I'll do it when I'm in my car. Yeah, I'll give you, I'm a, I'll give him the offering. And then we expect all of heaven to be poured out upon us. Can I ask you a question? What if heaven gave you back today all you've given it? Would it be enough? Would it be enough? Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. Listen, even when God has done a miracle in our lives, our troubles may not be over. It may get worse. You just took my food. You just, you just took the oil. You just took my last meal and now you've taken my son. Now you want my son. The famine was a terrible experience but the worst was yet to come. Remember in the beginning I said to you, how would you ever know what you're made of if you didn't go through a difficult time in your life? How would you ever know what's on the inside of you if we didn't face difficulties? Come on, some of us are a whole lot stronger than we thought we were. Have you ever faced that? Ooh, I faced some things in my life and I thought, Lord, you think a whole lot more of me than I think of me. God's provision is never given in order for us to rest upon it. We need to depend on Him as much every single day. I need Him more today than I needed Him yesterday. I'll need Him more tomorrow than I needed Him today. Come Tuesday, if Jesus tarries, I'll need Him more Tuesday morning than I needed Him on Monday. The Bible said in 1 Kings 17, verse 8 through 10, the Lord spoke this word to Elijah, go to Zarephath and live there. I've commanded a widow there to take care of you. And so he went on to Zarephath. God told Elijah to walk more than 100 miles during a drought through dangerous territory where everyone knew who he was and everyone knew King Ahab had a price on Elijah's head. Miracles don't happen when things are comfortable. Miracles don't happen when things are comfortable. The path to a miracle is always through uncomfortable territory. Think about it. When Moses led the Israelites out of slavery to the promised land, they had to go through the Red Sea first. Before David could slay Goliath, he had to walk out onto the battlefield. And before you get to your miracle, 
there's going to be some dark, difficult days and some paths that God will send you through. But let me tell you, and we're going to pray for you. Let me tell you, in those difficult days, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll never turn my back on you. Don't, don't look, don't get your eyes on what everybody else says. Don't get caught up in what everybody else says. Just keep your eyes on me. Keep putting your feet, keep putting your feet right in the footprints of God that have gone before you to make a way where there seemeth to be no way. Oh yeah, everybody has an opinion on what you ought to do. I said everybody has an opinion. Well, you ought to do this and you ought to do that. I want to know what does God say for me to get my miracle. Amen. Path to a miracle isn't always easy. But if you'll put your hand in the nail-scarred hand of Jesus Christ, victory tastes very, very sweet on the other side. Come on, and when you get on the other side of it, when you get on the other side of that difficulty and you can look back, you can say, well, that wasn't really as hard as I thought it was. With God's help, that wasn't really as hard as I thought it was. And I close with this right here. Most of the difficulties you go through have nothing to do with you any whatsoever. It has to do with people watching you to see if you're going to give up just before you get your miracle. But I'm not giving up. I said, I'm not giving up before I get my miracle. I'd like to ask everybody in the house if you would stand. The beginning of the service, I asked if you needed a miracle, if that was you, to raise your hand. There were hands all over this house. If you were one of those, and if, so, and if not, you didn't raise your hand, you need a miracle, I want you to come from wall to wall, all the way across the front of this sanctuary right now. Don't stand there one second. Come on. Come right now. I need